Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King and I'm excited to tell people about Jesus. And today I have a special guest. His name is Michael Ross and he's been very involved in doing evangelism and planting Bible schools. Brother Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation, Daniel. So tell me a little bit about how you got started doing evangelism. Well, what happened was I got saved in 1984 when I was a pot smoking car racing punk in Northern California. And then I went on this journey of studying the Bible with my dad and we ended up becoming total heretics. <laughs> and uh, that's another story, but in 1992 I ended up at a Rodney Howard Brown uh, conference in Anchorage, Alaska. So we were living in Alaska at that time. And for the first time, I saw the move of the Holy Spirit. And first I thought, oh, they're just being emotional, you know. So, uh, but I saw those that really abandoned themselves and surrendered in worship would be the same ones that would be on the floor laughing uncontrollably a short time later. And so I started worshiping like that. And so I ended up getting filled with the Holy Spirit, recommitting my life to Christ. And for the first time, I got mentors that started to really mentor me in the things of the kingdom of God. Because like I say, my dad and I, we, we were heretics. We were like the Apostle Paul before he got converted, you know. We were, we were those kind of guys, guys you didn't want to meet. But, uh, so anyway, but you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I did. And once I had the encounter with the Holy Spirit, right after that, I hooked up with the evangelist of the church, and I, uh, the, the local rescue mission opened up for me. And I started to speak in the rescue mission. And the prison opened up for me about six months later. I started speaking in prisons around Alaska. But actually, just to go back a step, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I was on the floor, I had this vision. And in the vision, I was walking down a hallway with Jesus. He opened a door to my right, and I walked in, and there was thousands of people for me to speak to. And I thought, wow, that's, that's crazy, you know? And so I started doing evangelism, and I started going out with... The guy's name was Joe Mulcahy, and we'd go into different parts of Alaska doing revivals in different native villages. And we saw some amazing, amazing things. But that's how I got started in evangelism. And then what has God done since then? I know you've gone to Africa quite a bit and done a lot of crusades over there. What, what doors and opportunities has God opened for you? Well, I stayed up in Alaska for about eight years doing a lot of different kinds of evangelism. Then I ended up moving down to Southern California and I ended up reading a, a book, uh, a Christmas magazine, where it talked about Mike Francine and how he's doing big crusades on, and overseas. And I didn't know anybody that was doing that. I mean, that was, that's a, that's a, California is like a lost in space kind of area, you know. It's not like Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there's evangelists everywhere, there's missionaries everywhere. And so I, but I, but I saw that. And I said, wow, that's me. That's, that's the vision that I had. And so... Um, uh, I didn't know anybody was doing it though, so I finally just decided maybe, maybe I just gotta go and do it myself. You know, uh, if I could just find somebody to follow that's like Mike Francine, that'd be great. But I couldn't find anybody, so I just started doing a class called Saturday Soul Winning, which was uh, relative to Tommy Barnett's Saturday Soul Winning, and we would do a carry the cross outreach in front of a Knott's Berry Farm in Disneyland. I built these two eight-foot crosses, and then we would do street dramas. And we would do uh, what we called the spiritual interview. We would interview any people in a mall with about 10 questions that ended up... Give me some of those questions that you'd ask people in the spiritual well, interview. Well, you know, like, uh, do, you, do you consider Buddha and Muhammad and, and Jesus to be spiritual people, you know? And then it, it, it asks you all these questions. Do you consider yourself to be spiritual? And it gets down to the question of, if you died today, do you know where you'd go? And so we called it the spiritual interview. I still have it in my And house. so you're, you're opening up a conversation about spiritual things, and that, then that gives you the opportunity to, to share the gospel. Because, Absolutely. of course, many people in California probably think they're, they're spiritual but not religious. Right, a lot of New Agers. Yeah, and then we also did door-to-door -door evangelism. We did, I, took this, I took the team down to the rescue mission. I, I took them to Home Depot. You got, it's, it's now a good moment for a short testimony? Go for it. So I, I, I take them down to, uh, to the Home Depot, and I'm going to set up my barbecue with my 15 event, growing uh, evangelist disciples, you know. And I got 
permission from the general man assistant manager the week before. So we, we come out there and we're going we're gonna to cook up carne asada. And there's like 150 Hispanics that are waiting for work. So this, this hey, here we are. This is our outreach. And so we start setting up. And this guy from the HR and Home, Home Depot comes out and says, Hey, you can't do this outreach here. You're con contributing to these, these illegal aliens, you know. And so I thought, oh my God, what, what am I doing here? You know, this is, this is not working out here. But somebody said, hey, let's just go to the sidewalk. I mean, it's public property. They can't kick us off. So we moved, we moved everything to the sidewalk, and we started the carne asada at the barbecue, and put out our tables, rice and beans, and guacamole, and so forth. And we went out to try and assemble the people, all the Hispanics, hey, we got free food for you, you know? And, there, and the police came. And I thought, oh, this is not going good. <laughs> Yeah. This is not going good. But they went to the other side of the parking lot. So, okay. So we went on with the we went on with the outreach, and I had the uh, Hispanic pastor from my church stand up and preach Jesus. And we had about oh I don't know we had about 70, 70 80 Hispanics there, you know. And we he preached Jesus like a like a passionate mad dog, you know. Did a great job in Espanol. And then we passed out these new New Testament Espanol Bibles and uh, led them to Jesus. And so about that time, you know, and they'd all eaten and everything. It, it actually went great considering the bad start. The, the police came over to me and he says, uh, uh, who's in charge of this? And I said, I am. <laughs> and he says, hey, you know, I've been stalling on your behalf, but really you can't do your outreach here. I said, well, thank you so much, sir. We're done now. Thank you. But anyway, so that was one of my outreaches. It's actually in my book there. Wow, you've got a, a great book here. It's called Miracle Memories, 42 Supernatural Stories from My Life in Ministry. And so I really like the format of this book. In fact, I, I liked it so much that I'm going to copy it for this, <laughs> one of my future books. But you've got a, a story of what God has done in, in different parts of the world. And then you have a, a miracle moment with a little application from the story. And so I, I'm taking this idea ah! and <laughs> I'm going, uh, one of my next books, I'm just going to go through and collect all the stories from from the 20 years of evangelism that we've done. And, and there's great stories. And I find that when I go preach at churches, people like the stories. They oh, love sure. hearing the stories the of what God has done. The, the, the so testimonies. Powerful. And, and uh, then I'm just going to do a little teaching from, from each one of them. And uh, so I like I liked your book so much, I'm, I'm copying it. But, <laughs> but I'm not copying your stories, I'm using my own stories, but I, I love the format. That's great. So, so tell us some of the, the miracle memories that you have in your book. Well, I'll tell you another memory that happened when I was in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I went to preach and do evangelism. The first I was with this guy named Joe Mulcahy, who was a full-time evangelist, and he was training me, discipling me. And then I started to do some of my own stuff. So I went out with this team from my church, and we went out to a place called Bethel, Alaska. And this is way back about 1996, you know. And actually what, I had been studying the Word, you know, as, and, and really became a heretic. But actually all that Bible study uh, really helped me. Because now, when I stood up to preach, I understood so much of the Word of God, you know, from all that years of study, even though we went off the heresy. So I had to make some corrections and so forth. But uh, so when I stood up to preach, actually the anointing really fell on me, and the authority, and the presence of the Holy Spirit flowed through me. And so when when we were in Bethel, Alaska, it was about we were doing like a week long of meetings, you know, nightly meetings. And that night it was a blizzard. I mean, it was a horizontal blizzard in Bethel, Alaska. It's on the west coast of Alaska. And but nevertheless, about 150 Native Alaskans, the village is probably 95% Native Alaskans, showed up to my meeting, you know. And so I'm sitting on the front row, and they're doing the worship, and I'm saying, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And usually, I have time to prepare beforehand to, to ask the Holy Spirit what he would like me to say. But in this case, I was short on time, whatever, whatever the circumstances. And he says, I want you to preach on forgiveness. And I said, but Lord, I talked about forgiveness at least a little bit last night. He said, I want you to preach on, preach on forgiveness. And I was arguing with God, if you can believe that, <laughs> on the front row before I'm supposed to speak. And so I said, I, I, I tell you what, God, I'll make you a deal. You show up in some powerful words of knowledge and healing and then I'll know it's you. So he says, okay. He says, call people up forward with their problems in the lower back and with their teeth. And so I said, okay. And then it was about my time. They 
they introduced me, I stood up, and I just said, I feel like the Holy Spirit says, there's some people out there that have problems in your lower back and people with problems with your teeth. Please come forward. So four people came forward, and um, I walked over the first one, put my hand right behind his, just one hand on the lower back, and just said, Lord Jesus, you know, be healed in Jesus' name, and just put my hand there, and, and the, the person literally, boom, when I started praying, flew backwards like four feet. And there was no catcher, you know? And they, the boom, like, like almost like an angel hit him with a two by four or something. And I thought, oh my God. I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. And the people, but, but I kind of like, I'm, I'm cool about this. Like this happens to me all the time, you know? Really didn't at all, but anyways. So I went to the next person. I said, be healed in Jesus name, like that. And, and they flew back on the ground. The, the second one did. And then, so I went to two people with teeth probs put my hands on their teeth, be healed in Jesus' name, and the person burst out in tongues. And the last one, be healed in Jesus' name, and then also, he also flew back on the ground, like four feet backwards, and with no catcher, you know, and obviously it was God, otherwise they might have been hurt, but I thought, wow, that's, that was good, God. That was, you, you totally got my attention here. You, 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 so I preached on forgiveness, and in my message, I talked about, uh, from my own life testimony, about asking God for forgiveness of your sins, and then the importance of forgiving others, very, very powerful. And the third thing, forgiving yourself, which can be the hardest thing for people. So I went to each one of them carefully and told testimonies from my own life. And then afterwards, I, I had the people stand up and I led them to a prayer with those three areas of forgiveness. And about the time I was done with the third prayer, the presence of the Holy Spirit fell in that native Alaskan church and the whole place went wild. And I, I, I stepped back and said, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. Because people were shaking uncontrollably. People were going into trances. People fell on the ground. Uh, people were crying. People were laughing. And not just a few people. I mean, the whole place went wild. And I'm like, oh my God. And I looked at my team members and they looked at me. And, Whoa, this, this is just God. This has nothing to do with us. This is just God. And so... Um, as a matter of fact, after that meeting, the next day a girl testified how she'd went up to heaven and told the whole story, and people testified of healings and miracles. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to get back to the local rescue mission in Anchorage, Alaska. It's going to be a blowout! But it wasn't. It was like the same regular meeting, you know, because it was the hunger of the people that was really pulling on God. Those people were hungry. Yeah, that's interesting. There, there's different responses in different places because the, the ground is different. Sometimes you're, you're busy planting seed. Sometimes you're wander, watering the seed. You're watering the seed. Sometimes you get to reap the harvest. Sometimes, though, you got to go out with a plow and dig up big stones yeah. out of the hearts of people. So, yeah. so every place you go, there, there's a different response. And, and sure. that's one of the things to, to know that, that sometimes you can have a great success in one area and then other areas you're just working really hard and nothing is happening. Sure. But it's all part of, of bringing in the harvest. One of the things I really like about you is that you are a bivocational evangelist. You love doing evangelism, love going to Africa and preaching the gospel, but you also have your own construction company and you're doing projects here in the United States. In fact, a lot of the support that you need in order to, to do crusades and do ministries comes from your business. So there's different paradigms that people have for doing evangelism. And, and one paradigm is to just fundraise and ask people for money. But that's not the only way of doing evangelism. You can also be a successful evangelist and have a job and earn money in, in some way. So talk to me a little bit about how that works and, and, and why you've decided to, to do business that way. Well, I, I would say, Daniel, that um from the beginning, I was a businessman, and I've grown tremendously in my own faith by running a company. And uh, I've been an entrepreneur now for over 30 years. And so when you have to believe God for more jobs and money to make payroll and all that kind of stuff, and you have to be accountable before God to pay your tithes and your offerings, 
that that builds tremendous faith as a, as a human being and as a businessman. So I've grown so much through having my own business that I probably couldn't have learned if I just tried to go into full time evangelism, you know, under a, a past pastor or a church or something like that. So I really thank God for how that's that's come about, and I would say that now my business is doing far better than ever before. My business doubled last year. I, I bought a siding company two and a half years ago, and my income literally doubled from 2019 to 2020. And so, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's good because as a businessman, I can always fall back on my company and not be, uh, have to feel like I need to beg for money or, or have to do more fundraising. And that puts a certain ease in my heart. And just to say something else about it was, which be, God would tell me, over, see, the, I've gone 18 times to East Africa in the last 11 years. And so he would tell me, son, I want you to do a crusade in a city, say, like Machakos, Kenya. And I said, okay, Lord. And then he, he would help me set the dates. And then I would call my team on the other side of the ocean, and we'd set it up. And now, I might not even have the money to do that, but I'm just... The Father says, you're doing a crusade in Machakos, these are the dates, and now I'm just going to believe God for the money. I mean, you have to do the same thing in a similar way, but so many times what would happen was, like maybe a week or two before I was supposed to go, I still didn't have the money, but I was still believing God. And uh, so, uh, sure enough, a job would come, say a $10,000 paint project or something, and sure enough, and, I, and I, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to get this done on time, but it would get done on time, I would get the check, I'd put the money in the bank, and boom, I had the money to go. That happened so many times. But other times, I left, and there was one time in particular I left, I was supposed to do cruci two crusades, uh, one in India and one in Africa, and I was supposed to pay for a Bible school graduation, and when I left, I had $5 in my pocket. <laughs> So I said, I'm not going to freak out about this. I'm not going to get in fear. I'm just going to speak in tongues and stay in the spirit and just trust God that somehow, some way, this is all going to get paid for. And got on the plane and left. And I had two people coming with me on that trip, and I didn't want to tell them because I didn't want them to be discouraged. But nevertheless, I got there, and the money started rolling in from my company back in California. And uh, the funds came. Some friends found out about it, and they helped me. And so in the end, I paid for everything. But so, uh, so thank God. <laughs> what, yeah. a, what a miracle. That, yeah, it's sometimes it takes a lot of faith to be an evangelist and to, to step out in faith. And, and we've seen God provide time and time again, sometimes from sources that you would never expect. And, and you're trusting God, say, God, I pray for the money. And, and God provides because evangelism is, is close to his heart. And so what, what percentage of your ministry is supported by your own company and your own efforts? Is it? Well, I'd say over the last 11 years when I've gone these 18 times to Africa, and some of those times I went four times a year. Uh, as a short-term evangelist, I would go for typically about two and a half to three weeks. And I would, honestly, I'd have to trust God to run my company while I was gone and believe God that it's all gonna work out and, and none of my customers are gonna get really mad and my employees are gonna be able to handle it and so forth. So there, there again was some faith to believe God for that. But I would say about probably 90 to 95% of uh, every all the crusades I would do, and sometimes I would drop 15,000 per crusade, sometimes 20,000, would come straight out of my company. And so sometimes I would drop as much as 50, 60, 70, $80,000 a year on these crusades I was doing to reach people for Jesus. And uh, so that was, that's a been an honor and privilege. Well, thank God for providing for you that way. It's sometimes tough to, to solve a problem for someone in Oklahoma when you're on the telephone in the middle of Africa. You got to call back. And I'm sure you guys still deal with customers yeah, and, and, yeah. and run all the details and make sure people are showing up to do the work that you hired them to do. And, yeah, it's been and, crazy at times. Wow. And, and then in addition to, to doing the Crusades, you've also been planting Bible schools uh, affiliated with uh, uh, Victory Bible Institute, so, so IVBI's International Victory Bible Institute, uh, which was the Bible school started by Pastor Billy Joe Doherty out of Victory, which is my home church. And it's amazing. They have, I think, over 2,000 Bible schools now in different parts of the world. How many of those Bible schools have, have you been able to plant? 
Well, we have about 12 going right now. And what happened was I went and did this crusade in Katui, Kenya. And then we went and did another crusade, a place called Machacos. And the Spirit of God began to speak to me, Son, these people have tremendous hunger for God. But their depth of understanding is only about an inch deep. It's a mile wide, but it's only about an inch deep. And so I, I realized after a couple of trips to Kenya that nine out of ten pastors had no Bible training whatsoever. So they would, they would go to a scripture in the Bible and, and read a scripture, and then they'd go off on an exhortation because they couldn't link scripture to scripture to scripture to make a powerful message. So, except for the Holy Spirit, for example. So they just go off on an exhortation because they didn't understand, you know. So the Spirit of God began to speak to me. He said, son, I want you to start launch Bible schools here in East Africa. So I went ahead and took a course that uh, Ron Stafford's wife, Jill Stafford, was doing at Victory called How to Launch an International Victory Bible School. I took the course. I probably was not a very good student because at that time I was flying back and forth to California running my company and missing classes. But anyways, I, I, I took the course. And then when I next time I went to Kenya, I cast a vision with the bishop I was working with. I, I think what qualifies you as a good student in that course is if you actually plant a Bible. Yeah, school. right. <laughs> so, so I think you get uh, an A plus for now having planted twelve it's, Bible schools. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so you went to, back to Africa with the bishop there and, and cast the vision. Cast the vision to him and his three overseers that represented about a hundred churches. And they said, great, let's do it. Later he told me he thought I was crazy. But anyways, so he, he went for it. And that was about September. And we were going to start the Bible schools in January. So I had a good friend of mine, Russell Abbott, who is a New Zealander who is now living in Rwanda. He came and helped me. And we launched the first Bible school. And in, in the end, we had 76 students graduate that year. And it was a smashing success. The students thought this was like the most important, greatest thing they'd done in their life. And you know, we, we made it as free of charge as possible. We wanted to especially reach rural pastors and pastors that didn't have any means. And they would come to class and, you know, their collars would be all wore out, you know, because they didn't really have any good shirts. And they'd have a blue shirt on and red pants, this kind of thing. Because they didn't really have any money. But uh, nevertheless, we'd give them the Bible schools 27 courses, 15 hours per course. And it was just, it was just amazing. And these 76 students went off to launch churches, become evangelists, become missionaries, and the fruit was just there. And I'm like, oh my, my goodness, this is great, Lord. This is, this is a great idea you had. And so since then, we've had like 3,500 students God, graduate. you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> we've had like 3,500 students graduate our Bible Wow, schools. that's amazing. 3,500 Yeah, students. so I usually go every November with a whole box of certificates and we pass out these certificates and because they look so good and I have them printed here um, and they're on American paper which is a big thing for Africa that they actually are received by many of the local universities as accreditation schools even though they're it's not so anyways uh, so that's kind of a little blessing because students say when can you accredit the school and I said well it's quite a quite a difficult process but what happens is uh, the paper they, we give them ends up being received anyways as a credit. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Talk to me about being bivocational in, in the faith it takes to do that. What advice would you give to other evangelists who they have a job, but they have a heart for evangelism? How should they get started? Well, I would say they just, uh, first thing is to follow the Holy Spirit, you know, and realize that Paul was a tent maker. He was making money. And he was very concerned that people might accuse him of fleecing the flock and taking the people's money. So that's one of the reasons he, he goes into this long argument about it in the book of Corinthians about why he's, you know, making tents and he, he didn't ask anything from their church. So um, anyway, so I think it's a it's a great... A start to have your own job or your own business and to start saving money whatever it may be and if anything just accompany uh, a evangelist like Daniel and go with him overseas and experience it and that's a great place to start is find somebody that's really doing it successfully and go with them you know get discipled and see how it's done and that that's only going to cost you you can do that for Daniel could probably get you somewhere or I could get you somewhere for probably two thousand dollars you know I would probably go back to Africa again, you know. So, um, and then 
a person could get great training skills and do a hands-on ministry. I'll tell you what, Daniel, one of the most greatest things, a little bit diversion from your question, but is to, when I take people with me and I send them out to the streets, you know, or to prisons, and this has happened, I probably had at least six or seven come with me. They come back weeping and crying. I mean, they lead 50 or 100, 200 people to Jesus. And it's like mind-blowing for them, you know? And they come back weeping and crying like their whole life has been transformed and they see their call and their destiny before them. And, and now they're actually doing this stuff, not just hearing about other preachers going out and doing this stuff, but they're doing this stuff themselves. And so that's very thrilling. That's one of the greatest joys I get is releasing other people to help them find their destiny in evangelism and maybe it's pastoring, you know, but it's doing the stuff, so... Yeah, that's a great place to start. Go, go with someone else who's doing a crusade, learn from them, and, and you'll find that God will start to open up doors for you to do crusades and, and, and to be involved in evangelism. All right, we're almost finished here, Brother Michael, but give me one more really good story out of your book, Miracle Memories. What, what's something really memorable that God said well, in your life? I, I had many great stories, but I, I think one of the ones that's really stunning that really rocked my world as well was my first trip to Kenya, which was I had gone to Mozambique and hung out with Heidi and Roland Baker with Randy Clark and had a great time there, was chosen to be one of the leaders and that was a great, great uh, a l rising to a new level, spiritual level. Because the truth is, if you go on mission trips, you're gonna go to the next level. I mean, I, I hear that from people all the time, you know, they, they go on a mission trip, you know, wow, it was so exciting, you know, this, this and this happened to me. And I think to myself, they've only gone on one or two mission trips. I've gone, you know, to 40 or 50, you know. And so anyways, a little diversion. But anyways, so we, so the second trip was that I had to have this guy named Chris Walsh. And uh, I met Chris Walsh, and of course you know him, Daniel. Yeah, we've had him on the, the show before. So if you're listening, you can go back and listen to the interview with Chris Walsh on the Evangelism Podcast. It was a great interview. He has a real heart for the First Nations people up in Canada. Right, so Chris was gonna do this crusade with a certain bishop in Kenya. And uh, and I was all excited because I just got back from Mozambique. And I said, well, I'll go and, and I'll just be your, I'll just assist you. And he said, great, let's go. So we set the date and it came to pass that Chris could not come up with any money for the trip or for, or for anything, for a plane ticket or anything. And he, every, every week it was, I believe in God, I believe in God, but still no money came for him. But I had the money. So finally, I was praying. I said, Lord, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. I mean, Chris doesn't have any money. This, this whole thing's going to get canceled. He says, yeah, I felt my spirit. Oh, no, something's going to happen here. So uh, four days before we were supposed to go, Chris calls me up and says, look, Mike, I still don't have any money, and I'm canceling. But the bishop has asked me if you'll come. And uh, because they've already promised the, these pastors in a place called Kitui, which was a large witchcraft area, that a, a white man, a Mzungo, is coming to preach to them. And so I said, well, let me ask, ask the Lord. And so I prayed after I got off the phone. I said, Lord, I looked up to heaven, and what do you think about this? And he says to me, you're going to Africa. Wow. So, so I, I called up the airline, and I said, hey, you know that ticket I was talking to you about a couple of weeks ago to Nairobi, Kenya? What's the price on that anyways? And she, she looks it up. She says, well, Mr. Ross, it's still $1,200. And I said, wow, cool. I thought maybe it doubled or tripled with four days four days notice. Sure. And, I, and maybe it was even three days. I kind of forget. But anyway, so I said, book the ticket. And so, uh, I, so I went on three days notice. And I didn't know this bishop from, from a, a shoe, you know. Uh, he could have been the, the, the Kenyan mafia for all I knew. You know, so I just... And I talked to him on the phone for about 30 seconds. That was it. And supposedly he was this bishop. So I, I flew to Nairobi, praying in tongues, you know, trying to stay in the spirit. And I, I mean, here I'm going to Nairobi. I don't know anybody. And, uh, and I get off the plane and, and, and he, 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 go outside. And here's some guys holding my, hold a sign with my name on it. I thought, well, that's a good start. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me on the way over there. He said, son, you're one of my lions. And I said, wow, that's, that's nice of you. That's cool, Lord. I'm excited about that. So they took me to the hotel and um, I got there. And Kenya's a good place to be a lion because they've got lots of zebras ah! to, for lions to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so I get there. I go to my hotel room, and what's above my bed? A picture of a lion. And so I thought, wow, this is a good start. It's actually working out something, you know. So I ended up flying to Eldred, Kenya, where the bishop was. 
this bishop was, and he turned out to be like the Billy Graham of, of Kenya. He like knew everybody, and he was a nice, really sweet man, and full of the love of Jesus, and, and he was a, an amazing evangelist. And so we went ahead and we did a couple of radio shows and stuff like that, and then we went off to Katui. Now this Katui area of Katui was kind of a semi-arid area, and they hadn't seen, seen rain in some five years. So we thought, hey, we're going to bring the gospel because we know it's their devotion to witchcraft that's stopping the, the blessing of rain for Africa, which for them is like life, life and death. And so um, we went there, and I thought, maybe we're going to have a showdown with the witch doctor or something like that. But we didn't. We just drove into town and started raining. And so it started raining, and we had uh, people doing the Jesus video project at schools, and we were doing street evangelism. The whole team was. Brought a team of about 25 people, you know, Kenyans. And uh, Katui is a very poor area. I mean, a, a very sad, but young girls would sell themselves for a bottle of Coke. I mean, that's, that's how, how bleak the place is, you know. And the cows were skin and bones, and they were going through the trash looking for food. And so uh, the rain came, though, and that was exciting. And so the bishop's going to do his, his meeting in the evening, and he has me do the pastor's conference in the morning. And so it's raining all day, and we say, and we, so, we, so we got together and we said, look, it's great that it's raining, but it's going to rain our crusade. So we prayed this prayer. Lord, make the rain stop, and then at the end of the crusade, make it pour. And so we prayed this bold prayer, and the rain stopped. And the bishop went out there, and about 2,000 people showed up, you know, a small crusade. He preached Jesus, you know, and I gave a short testimony. And as soon as he was done preaching, it started pouring rain. And all the Kenyans ran back to their homes. And so it rained all night, rained in the morning, did the pastor's conference, it was raining, and, and then in the afternoon it stopped. And so Bishop and I came back there to do the evening crusade. About 4,000 people shows up. Typical African crusades, they double every night. And so we preached Jesus and all that stuff, and uh, as soon as he was done, started pouring rain. <laughs> and it rained all night long, rained in the morning, I did the pastor's conference, rain stopped, came out there the third day, the rain stopped, 8,000 people came, you know, and we did, the, we did preaching to Jesus, and I got to preach some, you know, for the first time in my, my crusade. First time I ever got to preach in a crusade. Actually, it was fulfillment of the vision I'd seen as when I first got, in Holy, first got filled with the Holy Spirit, that all these people were there, you know. And so uh, as soon as we were done, started pouring raining. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It was weird. Three nights, three nights in a row, the rain stopped for the crusade, and then otherwise it was pouring rain. All the Kenyans ran back to their home, and by the fourth day, I looked on the ground, and I could see grass growing. And it was incredible. It's really incredible. And so uh, the, the fourth night, we had people bring their items of witchcraft, and we burned them on the stage publicly. So it was a very powerful first crusade for me, and it gave me kind of a reputation that I was kind of an Elijah or something like that, you know, in Kenya. And then the next crusade, I came back to see him with also witchcraft area Machacos, and I said to Bishop, I said, Hey, Bishop, uh, what exactly happened in that uh, Machaco's crusade? He said, Brother Mike, you haven't heard half of the story. He said they had so much rain, they had an overabundance of crops. Wow. And I'm like, wow, that was amazing. So that, was, that just really rocked my world, changed my life, gave me a whole new vision, built my faith, and everything else. So the crusade brought physical blessings as well as spiritual blessings. Absolutely. And I don't know how many got saved, but we had, we had a great... Wow. It was great. Well, if you're enjoying listening to Michael's story, I encourage you to go to Amazon, find Miracle Memories by Michael Ross. Just type in Miracle Memories, Michael Ross, and you'll be able to find his book and, and see all the stories from what God has done in his ministry around the world. Brother Michael, thank you so much for being with me today. Hey, thanks so much, Daniel. I enjoyed it. God bless you. You too. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.